Hello. I was recently joined by Games Workshop alumni Robin Dews and John Stallard to talk about their new book in which they interview 17 other former GW staff members about their recollections working for the company over the years. In our conversation, we talk about their favourite anecdotes from the book, their favourite interviews, and some of their favourite GW games. Amongst many roles at Games Workshop over the decades, John Stallard was the sales director for the company in the 2000s, before leaving to found Warlord Games, the historical miniatures company. Whilst Robin Dews was one of the longest serving White Dwarf editors, as well as the design studio manager. Together, they have a wealth of experience and memories and history at Games Workshop during some of its most interesting periods, including through its evolution to the start of the company that it is today. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm talking miniatures with Robin Dews and John Stallard. Thank you both for joining me, Robin, John. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and have a chat with me about your new book, Talking Miniatures. And we're also going to talk a bit about your your favourites from the book and from your time working at Games Workshop. P playing favourites a little bit, the games you enjoyed working on, the games you enjoyed playing, and the stories that you've enjoyed hearing and telling from the book, Talking Miniatures. So I guess, should we start a little bit with with the book itself and uh, how you came to write it and sort of what what is Talking Miniatures? What's the nature of this book? Go and have a go, John. I'll have a go at that one. Uh, how did it come about? Very quickly. Uh, Robin and I have known each other for many years through Games Workshop. And even though um, we don't work together, uh, Robin does a lot of uh, uh, sage advice to other companies and and hires himself out when you get into a muddle. And uh, we're chatting, sitting in my garden, having a cup of tea, almost five years ago now. And we... I, something came up and made us chuckle. And I said, if you told that people, people today, they wouldn't believe that, you know. And we we chuckled again. And we thought, well, we should write it down. And uh, I thought, well, who's going to do that? Well, it wasn't going to be anybody else, really. It's going to be us two. So we thought, yeah, let's write it down. Let's do a book. Uh, Robin's kind of retired. He's got some time there. And uh, he's got his, uh, his dreaded recording, um, very clever recording uh, machine. <laughs> And so we thought we'd strike strike hard and strike sure. And we went around to see Rick Priestley, our good pal, because he's always good value. And we gave him a couple of hours of interrogation. And uh, and Rick, um, as ever, was charming and witty. And when we played it all back, it sounded just great. And we got some really good stories from Rick. So then we looked around for another 16 victims <laughs> and found... It, all in all, 17 voices, if you like, from the 1980s Citadel Games Workshop era, most of whom live still around Nottingham area. So we tracked them down and we would have done it sooner, apart from, of course, the great plague that came in and uh, stopped us going around the country. But uh, so it's 17 people's stories of what they remember and what was important to them all those 40 years ago now. Uh, it's certainly not a history but in there are historical facts and lots of fabulous stories to, uh, to to come out. And did you start then from a specific place then? Were you asking a specific question to those different individuals or was it like, let's just have a conversation and see where we go? I think the latter, wasn't it, Robin, really? Well, I, I've been looking through the book you know, because we're, we're very excited. We actually do have the book. Here's a book. <gasps> we're waiting for the slipcases. And actually... Most of the conversations, they start with, so how did you come to work for Games Workshop then? Because this was a very diverse range of individuals. And that was our first question. But it was just an opening question. And out of that spiraled lots of lots of different kinds of conversations. So yeah. we didn't, I think it's true to say, John and I are nowhere near organized or slick enough to have, a, to have an interview plan. And the people that we were talking are way too maverick and chaotic to kind of respond to any plan should we have one. So mm. we just, we got out the tea and the digestives and the, and, and we started talking and, and let the conversation flow in any direction it took. And sometimes it was wild and, and hilarious and, Oh, it was just all, all of those. I mean, the, there are lots of stories. So no, it, it wasn't a it wasn't a plan. Or we must get this this information. It was <laughs> we're going to sit down with these people and we're going to talk them. And we'll start with saying, "How did you come to work for Games Workshop?" Bob Naismith, Trish Carden, Chris Harbour, 
Tony Rick Priestley and see where that went to, you know, Andy Chambers. So all of those conversations flow in different directions, but the start point is, is fairly common. Did anyone have a particularly wild and wonderful story of how they came to... All of them. <laughs> no, how they got there, no, perhaps not weird and wonderful, but they all had great stories, mm. and uh, which, of course, most of them Robin and I didn't know about, and it, that, the very reason for the book, that they can be written down and... Uh, and uh, of course, everybody remembers things differently as well. Uh, so uh, the next people we saw was the, the wonderful Perry twins, uh, who were identical brothers, as we know. And, uh, well, they are now 60 years old and because they can finish each other's sentences and do. Uh, but they rem even those two would remember it slightly different. So it was very wonderfully chaotic trying to get through to what was most probably the real thing event. But uh, they were great fun. But what was even more chaotic about those guys is then trying to transcribe the tapes. Because obviously we've got two voices on the tape. We've known Mike and Alan for a long time and, and distinguished. But when these two guys finish each other's sentences and cut across each other, <laughs> I'm listening to the headphones and I'm 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 trying to transcribe this or or, or edit this. And who the hell is that? And sometimes you just don't know. I just, <laughs> I just I just gave it, and there are places I actually just put AP slash MP because it's well, either Alan or Michael or both. They, all they have a hive time. mind, don't they? Anyway, so it doesn't. They really do matter. have a hive mind, and and you know we could even in the course of that conversation at one point we were around at Alan's house, which is in which is in Nottingham when we did that conversation, and he lives in in a part of Nottingham, and a kind of tame squirrel came up. to he climbed in through the window and started eating nuts. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't <laughs> make this stuff up. And no. it, it was it was just it was just great. It was just really just great. And then some of them, as John said, uh, we had to do via Zoom. Mike McVeigh, uh, painter, as as most people will know, he lives up in the Lake District, and he's, he that's where he originally came from, the Lake. So we did we talked to Mike by Zoom. You know, a wonderful conversation. I haven't seen Mike for. Oh, probably 15 or 20 years, you know, I mean, really a long time. And actually, you know, Mike was one of my um, favorite people in the design studio. And he actually, at one point, he was he was renting a room in my house and living here. And, you know, he's just a lovely bloke. And we just had it was really nice to reconnect with some of these people that I hadn't been in touch with for sometimes 10, 15 years or more. Um, so, yeah, it was love. It, it was a wonderful process for me personally, I'm sure for John as well to actually be having these conversations, renewing these friendships and out of them capturing something that we think is really great for fans and enthusiasts of Games Workshop, of which I number myself a, also a <laughs> fan and enthusiast. I'm sure it was fantastic to, to, yeah, like you say, reconnect and talk with all of the people that you did talk with. Was there anyone in particular who you especially enjoyed chatting with and sort of getting recollections from? Mm -hmm. John, it would be invidious to say. I found is, it, is that an unfair question? Of yeah, which, which, which child would you like the best? <laughs> no, um, the one that moved me the most was uh, Paul Robbins, uh, who was the factory manager at Eastwood. Uh, very nice fellow, golden Z D demon sword winner as well. Paints like a god. Uh, very nice fellow. And um, he reminded me what a, uh, what a family and what a team Games Workshop became. Because uh, uh, we're we all moved to Eastwood, which is a Nottingham mining village, for those who don't know, where D.H. Lawrence was born and brought up, even though he hated it, mind you. <laughs> um, but uh, Paul writes a, a wonderful chapter on what great hardworking people we had uh, in the factory area, which doesn't always get the, the, the glamour, but uh, sometimes the sales guys or obviously the studio get. It's these people who also serve making marvellous models every day, day in, day out, to a high standard and uh, you know ever, ever increasing quality. So that's the one that perhaps put a tear in my eye. It was the that's it's quite right, John. And it was the passion there, wasn't it? You know, the the, the young women and not so young women who manufactured blister packs. Yeah. You know, they're working on a press where you put the blister pack in, then you put the miniatures in, and then you put the foam, and then you put the card, and then you bring a, a machine down that heat seals that pack. But they weren't just on an assembly line. All of those women knew what they were packing, and they were checking and looking at yeah. each casting before they put it into that blister pack you know this is part of quality control before quality control was a thing mm -hmm. because everybody was passionate about doing the best job they possibly could you know and we used to lovingly call them the blister sisters that was that was the <laughs> the nickname for the women that 
that made blister packs, but and the, but there were a whole team of them, and they were fabulous, and they did that day after day, day after day. You know, no no expectation of anything other than coming, doing a good job, having a nice time at work, working alongside other nice nice people, and then going home and and looking after their families. It was it was that was great. John's quite right. I mean, um, I I was just gonna say, I mean, that John's fond of that chapter. I'm really really fond of the conversation that uh, Rick and Tony Atland had. And we did a road trip. John, Rick and I piled into John's um, car and we went barreling down to Carbis Bay. And I say barreling down to Carbis Bay in Cornwall where Tony now lives. And we spent an evening in the pub with Tony. And then the following morning we assembled in the hotel and we put the recorder down on the table. And actually what I loved about that conversation is I almost kind of John and I were flies on the wall. You know, Tony and Rick hadn't seen each other for a while. Tony and Rick were the original design studio. The two of them were in a room together in Newark mm -hmm. with Tony doing illustrations, doing all the catalogues, all those line drawings that are in the early Citadel um, mail order sheets and catalogues because the company couldn't afford to do half tone reproduction, which is where you have to photograph a miniature and then put a half tone. That's expensive. Mm -hmm. A single continuous line tone is cheap. And so that's why that was done. But they, they put together between them the first edition of Warhammer in 1983 that was very exciting and actually quite moving listening to these those guys bouncing off each other and telling stories and uh, i felt a real privilege to be in the room with them at that time it was it was wonderful it was wonderful my cat's just arrived at the door by the way <laughs> <laughs> well my cat will probably make an appearance soon enough so yeah we'll have plenty of cats john you'll just have to make sure you've got one for I'm next sure. time we chat and we I'm can cover them all <laughs> so the, so the, so the lots of them i mean it, it's not it's not too absurd to say that actually the whole book has been a labor of love and it was a joy to produce in the way that we produced it and once we'd got after after as john has said after the conversation with rick where we listened back to those tapes and went wow that's a, that's a, that's a one i've never heard anything like that before this isn't an interview it's a conversation and that kind of gave us the title for the book talking miniatures um this conversation just flowed and and that we went, we've got it. We can do it. We can do this now. We we know what we're doing. We just go and talk to people and let them tell us their stories. And that will just be enough. You know, we don't have to do anything smart and clever and, and, and anything here other than let people tell their stories. Well, like you say, I think sometimes getting those different perspectives, especially because because like you say, John, as well, and those perspectives might not line up exactly because we all experience things differently. We all remember things differently. And it's impossible for any one person to to fully remember something as mammoth as what was happening at Games Workshop over the course of the 80s and 90s. So being able to delve into all of those different aspects of it must be really fascinating. It's one of the things I'm most enjoying, or oh, sorry, most looking forward to about getting hold of the book because it, it just is it's going to be fantastic to to sort of drill into that. I mean, are there any particular stories in there that, that really speak to you or uh, beyond the sort of favourite conversations, but there's just particular moments or events that people have recalled that come to mind as just that was, that was fascinating to hear that. Well, there is, I think I've mentioned earlier, but uh, the, how the chaos dwarfs got the hats by Rick Priestley is a wonderful <laughs> tale. Which has me shrieking with laughter every time I every time I read it. That's a that's that's a good one to look out for. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I mean, I've mentioned in a couple of interviews uh, the, the the wonderful revelation by Bob Naismith about the Space Marine backpacks and the World War One American soldier. But but there there are others. Uh, Andy Jones, um, who again some people will remember. No, he's just a fantastic storyteller. He's practically a raconteur. You could have him as an after-dinner speaker and he'd have you in stitches. And he told the story about the infamous, and I think it's probably up to now only infamous inside of Games Workshop, dark future live role play episode when most the design studio got in. There, there was an idea in, in the in the kind of early 90s. Um, what was it? Paintball. Paintball was becoming mm. popular. And Brian had this idea, said, oh, we could do a, a paint a games workshop or this little paintball thing and make some money, a little business. Because Brian was like a he was like a spinning wheel that threw off sparks of ideas, some of which caught fire and some of which didn't, you know, mm. Warhammer Records and anyway, <laughs> like a paintball. And so, of course, you know, that what could go wrong? So the studio 
um, got together, got a load of paintball guns, kitted themselves out in dark future costumes, <laughs> leather jackets, spikes, hoods, and all the rest of it, got into a couple of coaches and drove up to some woodland in Yorkshire and started <laughs> running around um, with paintball guns shooting each other in kind of kind of slightly chaotic fashion. And, and it was only um, a short time later, they could hear on loud, loud hailers going, put down your weapons, put down your weapons. And it was the North Yorkshire Armed Response Unit <laughs> <laughs> had, had turned up because somebody reported this group of terrorists had captured some coach drivers and were holding them <laughs> ransom. In the I mean... You, honestly, George, you can't make this stuff up. And Andy tells that story wonderfully. Very, very, very funny guy. It would have been a very bloody end to the studio. Well, it, well, it could. Because <laughs> Andy said, I had my gun in my hand, and this, I could see this guy, and he was in a police uniform. I thought, is he part of it? Is this part of the game? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like because obviously it was a creative place, right? And there's, there's all of these different creative ways of exploring the world as well. Like you say, yeah. Warhammer Records and different, like putting fiction out there and new games and new worlds and stuff. So well, what was it like to work that, in that well, environment? What, one of the things Brian wanted to do, you you see a thread through all 17 of the contributors as they'll bring Brian up every single time because he was so central to what we were doing. And I remember Brian also, uh, he always he was always behind the technology, um, um, wanted to do plastics a lot earlier, but the, the technology and the money just wasn't there. Uh, he also wanted to do a giant robot uh, fighting game, which in the end became Titanicus and things like that. But Brian wanted to do it uh, technically with electronic ones, you know, where we're battling robots, literally knocking bits off each other and uh, lights going on and knocking them out with sonic, you know, that's what he wanted in his head. But of course, um, it, it, the technology wasn't there in 1980 to do that. Um, and uh, so we had to make do with plastic robots in the end. But uh, I can see how it would have been great fun. But some of those ideas, almost in Titanicus, the plug fit weapons, so you could quickly change the weapons on the on your Titans and configure them for different kind of battles, close combat range. Some of that kind of still echoes through. That's kind of it's still it, it, it's still there. It's still there, and and it's a lot of again, Jordan. A lot of that is what we were kind of trying to. Those were the stories we captured, and 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 they're probably stories that haven't been told mm. in that way before. Because they're they're just how people experience. Well, you know, Tony Acklin. Because obviously, these people know each other very well. Tony Acklin told a story about um, Alan and Michael Perry, and when they were doing dragons. And Tony used to do lots of the early concept sketches, so he draw lots of helmets and shields and bits and bobs and give them. And he kind of drew it a dragon. And because he's an artist, he did cross hatching on the dragon to represent the scales. And he gave this to the Perrys and came back with a cross hatched dragon. And so Tony said to Alan or Mike, Oi, what are you doing? What's that cross hatch? He said, Well, that's what that was on the concept sketch. And he said, Well, you know it wasn't your little git. You know, kind of, <laughs> again, Alan and Michael were so young, they tell the story about how they first made some models and they 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 knew they went to Mike's model shop in Finchley because they were kind of North London boys and they said well you should go and take these down to Dowling Road because they 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 look at the people who can make orcs and goblins and, and monsters and they took them down to Dowling Road. I think they were 15 or 16 at the time and he's like hello where are the Perry doing <laughs> And they showed them to Ian and Steve, and Ian looked at these and went, "Wow, these are great! These are great!" And kind of undenied and said, um, "Yeah, how how does fifteen pounds a model sound?" And Michael said, "We were schoolboys doing a paper round for one pound twenty a week for walking up and down streets in the cold and rain. So fifteen quid a model sounded just fabulous money. We were, we were and so they kind of said, Ooh, "Yeah, yeah, we'll do that." <laughs> And Fantastic. again, you know, we're, we're, we're delving way back in time to people's mm. memories. And, you know, and, and again, it's that you, you get some sense of the kind of stories you can. And that's just, you know, they're the things that John and I can can remember at the moment. But you have to look through the book. I've, I've been reading it and rereading it since we got the proof copies and going, wow, this is great. We did get something great here. Yeah. I imagine there's quite a lot of intricacy and in how they overlap as well because obviously everyone is talking about that same sort of era and that same period and people do remember things slightly differently oh, they're completely contradictory some people <laughs> see one thing and some say no but i mean they weren't in the same room at the same sure. time the only people who were in the same in the room 
the, the consistent voices, if you like, are John and mine. You know, John and I were in every interview mm. and and sometimes, you know, John asked questions in one area, I would ask questions in another or make comments. I think John sat in the in the chair when Paul Sawyer and I the uh, two white dwarf editors were talking about who was the best white dwarf editor. <laughs> then, and then John, of course, asked the question, uh, did we ever fix battle reports to make the new army win? Never. And, and I'm not going to give you the answer. You have to read the book. <laughs> yeah, I think there's been a few people curious about that over the years, right? Well, it's, well it's, it's one of those great myths that the new army always won. <laughs> uh, and John and I, and not John, Paul and I, kind of went into well, largely in a, in agreement about the answer, but not entirely. <laughs> so, thinking then about the time the, when you were both working at Games Workshop, I mean, were there any particular like projects or or games products that you worked on or were involved with that that really stand out as those great memories of this was something I I loved working on. Oh, that's, I'd love to say all of them, because it's probably true. Um, from, from my from my end, it, my kind of games work, my career at Games Workshop goes, drops into three phases. There was kind of the early phase. I, I joined the company in 89 as uh, answering an, ad, an advert in White Dwarf for editors developers. And so I joined as an editor developer, working in the room with... Um, Jervis Johnson, Sean Masterton, and Mike Brunton. And I was all a bit starstruck. You know, I, was, I, was, I wasn't a young man, but I was going, Ooh, there's Jervis Johnson, there's Rick Priestley. <laughs> and um, so the first thing that I ever did that appeared in White Dwarf was a piece called Storm Riders about a skeleton chariot, where it was classic early studio. You'd get drop some models on your desk at nine o'clock in the morning, say we need the copy by three o'clock in the afternoon to get it into White Dwarf, you know, get on with it. It was work for hire. You know, quick and dirty done by 5.30 was the motto. That's, <laughs> what we, that, that's what we did. But, you know, the first piece you ever get published in White Dwarf, it, I'm, I'm not going to forget that one. And interestingly, Andy Chambers talked about the first thing that he ever did was um, some rules for Eldar Knights in, in uh, 40, in some knights in 40, in uh, Space Marine. Hmm. And that was his first piece in White Dwarf. And you kind of remember those things. Um, I was, I also was, a, I was a big fan, not of, of Third Blood Bowl when that came out, because it was an extraordinary thing for, for all of us. It was the first time Jervis and Jervis talks, you know, with a real heart about Third Blood Bowl was the first time that he shed imposter syndrome, where he kind of went, um, I because Jervis used to be a, a trade salesman like John. John used to be the head of trade sales for Citadel, and Jervis was head of sales for Games Workshop. That's right. what he did when he first joined the company. He was down in London. So Jervis and, and John used to work together on sales. And then Jervis one day said to Brian, I've got this kind of idea for a little game. And and so Brian said, We'll go and make it, go and go and write it then. And Jervis got together with Mark Gaskell and Ali Morris and Ali Morrison did all the uh, the drawings and that's how first blood bowl came about just because jervis who was trade salesman at the time had a good idea but what jervis did he 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 refined this game and polished it and did a beautiful job and not only he did that but he he put it out and so it was in the studio in the company wild uh, and elsewhere so while the rules were in development people would play every lunchtime people you know down tools and get out their teams and start playing blood bowl and say this really works and this was great and that was fun and actually blood bowl 3 which is one of the most polished things that was ever done by games workshop came out in that way because it was a real collective effort not only by the studio but people outside of the studio to do that and 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 I still got a real fondness for not just the game itself well I, you know I love the game and I have a team called the love pirates of doom which i still have next door <laughs> um uh apart from the broken ones because jeremy vitok who was in the u.s studio at the time he and i got into a real blood bowl duel with the results that, that if if we damaged one of one of the other's players we actually took that player put it on the floor and trod on it it was very cruel <laughs> but jeremy vitok is a bit cruel but that but that Jer Jez and I kind of played like that. Jeremy Vitok and I played a lot of Blood Bowl. So that I've got a fondness for that one. John, I'm going to shut, stop talking now and give you a go. So we didn't t have time for lunch breaks in sales departments. So <laughs> we had to sell all the rubbish they made. So there was no time, <laughs> no time for anything else. Uh, uh, most 
most fun I had at workshop, um, well, lots of fun in many areas, was uh, getting the momentum about getting the retail chain up and going um, and trying to develop that. Uh, and it became at times a bit of a runaway train, but uh, we just got on and did it as best as we could. We There was nobody to follow. It was all very entertaining. We made it up as we went along and uh, uh, and broadly got it more right than wrong. And uh, and I think delivered something 30 years before its time, before the rest of the high street caught up. So mostly proud of that and the bunch of lads and girls who 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 got that program up and running and then worldwide, of course. You know, they were, I think they have 600 stores worldwide now uh, of their own stores. Astonishing. Yeah, it's incredible. And that has stood the test of time, that retail arm of Games Workshop. And it, it does feel like it would be a very different organization and hobby, I guess, if that retail aspect of the Games Workshop hadn't been quite what it is. Well, the two things that people don't always realize, because uh, 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 why should they? Um, Games Workshop in the old days, particularly, I don't know the modern day, but they never advertised. They never take advert advertisements for anywhere because what they had were two wonderful things. There was White Dwarf magazine, which was their advert advertising in many ways every month, you know, um, uh, and the actual retail, our retail stores on the high streets. They were recruiting centres. So I always saw them like an army recruiting center with a sergeant major in there or a ringmaster, as we sometimes call them. But you've got your sergeant major in there and his job is to find every everybody in that town above 70,000 people who'd like to play with tabletop war games. And that was their job. And if they sold stuff as well, that's marvelous. Hmm. Uh, but it's the getting getting people through, bringing them in, playing those games on the tabletop. Showing the games of fun that they're that you know fast, furious, and fun was what were the three F's we used to say. Rick really hated that term, of course. Um, Rick likes games to be really complex, and you have to suffer for your art because he <laughs> said he had to, and that's in the book as well. How you say how difficult it was to get into tabletop wargaming. You had to be lucky and find an, an elderly uncle or an obscure <laughs> book in the library, and Rick would say it should be difficult to get into it. <laughs> so uh, I would say, Rick, you're taking it to extremes. It should be friendly and open to everybody. You should be able to get in, come in the store and think, wow, this place looks wacky. And, uh, you know, and that store manager, as you'd remember yourself to say, well, if you've got 20 minutes, I can show you how to play Warhammer. Oh, I don't know. I don't I'll go on. You be the goodies. I'll be the baddies. And, uh, and as you know, in general, the good managers would let the Wookiee win. So you go out thinking, well, I showed him. I'll, I'll come back again. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, it's getting that fun atmosphere into the stores. You've just reminded me, John, that back, I mean, again, I think we're probably late 90s, certainly after the move to Lenton, we used to have an, an intro gaming competition in retail where we'd actually um, get the guys would run intro games and you'd have, we'd have a, a store champion, then a regional champion, and then the regionals would come to head office and they'd show how to run an intro game. And actually do that exactly what John's described, saying to someone, well, if you've got five minutes, I'm sure you how to play Warhammer. And of course, you can't show somebody how to play Warhammer in five minutes, but you can get somebody to a table. You can put a big fistful of dice in their hand. You can get them to roll and say, oh, you've just killed that over there and engage them in the whole idea of yes, moving engagement to a that is, that is it. And it was brilliant. And those guys were just magnificent. The guys out in the retail stores who could do that day after day, day after day with absolute enthusiasm. And that 13 or 14 year old in front of them, seeing their eyes go wide with delight at this was just fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, Absolutely. you actually you, you actually used Warhammer with uh, your um, with the kids you used to look after. Robert. Yeah, I did. But I mean, before I joined Games Workshop, so in the late 80s, mid, mid late 80s, I was a youth worker in South East London. You know, after I left university, I retrained as a youth worker. I used to run youth centres. I had, I used to have these kids who's, you know, they're fairly wild kids in terms of their behaviour, and their attention span could be measured at tens of in tens of minutes. But I found that once I I brought in some of my models and showed them and showed them how to paint, and they would be painting miniatures and really focusing. They were then they would then go up to um, Oxford Street to Games Workshop and go and shoplift a load of new miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> And Nicolo, no, and Jack, no, 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 you're not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> and they go, yeah, but it's easy in there. Nobody's watching. You can just help yourself. 
they're all playing demo games in the stores. So yeah, you can yeah, yeah, all of that. And that's what I used to do. I used to run games of Warhammer, which is you know how I ended up getting a job at Games Workshop because I I ran a game of Warhammer with my kids for twenty four hours, and I sent the report of that into White Dwarf, and it was published as the Battle of Carrot Mound. It was I think one of the first ever battle reports that was published in White Dwarf, and I sent that in. And then the following month after it was published, I saw an ad in the magazine for editors developers. So I went, yeah, I can do that. And Sent in I'm... by Fagin. <laughs> <laughs> so so did, did you, obviously that was that was the ex, the sort of memories and the favorites of, of working on projects, working on games. Did you have favorite games to play back in the day? Like during your time at, at GW, was there a particular game that you looked forward to playing the most oh, you're going to set robin off about epic now here it comes i'm i'm keeping quiet <laughs> go on i'll have a go yeah i'm going to i've got to say apart from blood bowl actually there's got I, I i loved epic i loved epic 40k and the reason i love epic 40k is because I, I i put my hand up and i confess my great sin is i didn't like 40k very much and the reason I didn't like 40K wasn't about the imagery and the background and the story and the emperor and the space marines and chaos. It was because it didn't work on the tabletop for me. Mm. The scale was wrong because we're talking about a sci-fi uh, war game with bolt guns and las guns and plasma cannons. And once you put a rhino or a land raider on your average kitchen table, six by four, the scale collapses. You know, these these weapons should have ranges of thousands of, of, of yards or kilometers. I mean, the scale was wrong. But once you pick that up and translated it down to epic, so rather than one or two rhinos on the table, you had 10 or 20 and you had titans and you had uh, land raiders and you had all of the orc machines and the elder machines and th hundreds of infantry moving then it became really sexy for me that that <laughs> was that was 40k as it was in my head with these massive armies clashing on these strange alien worlds and so i was a huge epic fan and that had and still have a huge epic army and i loved epic 40k i, I went when you know after titan uh adeptus titanicus then the infantry were added in Space Marine, and then Space Marine 2, and then Titan Legions came out one Christmas and didn't quite work as a sales. It was just a bit too weird, focusing just these Super Titans. It wasn't a great seller, I think John would say, um, at that Christmas. It, it, it wasn't seen as a success. And so then there was a conversation with Andy and, and Jervis and, and Rick and, and all those people saying, how do we pull all this together and make something that really works? And... Um, I think Andy and Jervis did just a genius job with that Epic 40k rule system. I mean, really brilliant, brilliant in so many ways that I could articulate. But I think, you know, if I can put it in one, was the blast markers. Yeah. Those blast markers that actually in a in a visual graphic, and I have to say, the 3D blast markers was my idea. They had little round counters. And I said, look, no, look, we can do this. And we cut them, we put two, and you slot them together, and it'll be a little 3D thing. And we have two different sizes, fives and ones, or tens and ones, I can't remember now. Um, We've and, stolen that idea for bolt action. And and it's there. I mean, as a mechanic, it was just brilliant. It was brilliant because not only did it show you what was happening in the board, because the blast markers reduced their fire, reduced their movement, you know, they were under fire and pinned, but it gave you this visual on the tabletop. You could look mm. at the tabletop and say, that's the hot spot over there. That's where a lot's going on. This is the quiet sector on my left. And yeah, Alessio took that and put it into bolt action in the pin markers. And, it, you know, it's it was a mechanic that survived the test of time. And again, in one of the stories that Jervis puts in the book is he puts in his admiration for an American game designer called John Hill. And John Hill is famous in, in that American wargaming scene for Squad Leader, which was, I think, published in 77 and was a, a hex-based infantry game. But what John Hill did in that game, he came with, with, with called what, what called a... Um, uh, an effects table he basically said when you shoot at people they do one of three things they ignore it and carry on firing back at you they take a morale check and and stick their heads down and get and get undercover or they die and he said it doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether you're using a machine gun a tank a hand grenade a flamethrower they will either ignore you and shoot back they will get their heads down and stop firing at you or they'll die and so he didn't worry 
about he's what he called it a firepower factors table. And actually that Jervis and Andy took that firepower factors table into Epic, but it didn't, it didn't, people didn't quite get it. They mm. liked all the intricacies of all the different weapons and the different weapons having all different for you. It was too simple in yeah. for, for lots of people. They missed the genius. Mm. My, My favorite would definitely be Space Hulk. Uh many people's oh, yes. favorite, of course been uh, re-released by Games Workshop more time than we've all had hot dinners. Whenever things are looking down, bring out Space Hulk. Um, and a uh, fantastic game, Richard Hallowell's creation, I believe. It was. Uh, and the one I've never got was Blood Bowl. Completely <laughs> leaves me cold. What a load of old rubbish. Um, <laughs> uh, I love Jervis Johnson very dearly, and if he here and now, I'd tell him it. But yeah. it was fantastic for sales. The public love it, can't get enough of it, and well done, Jerv. But I just used to sit there thinking, I just don't get it, because it's not a war game for me. It's, it's a, a game about a game. Yes, so a bit too weird for me, but uh, my <laughs> God, it sold like hotcakes. <laughs> and great miniatures, some great miniatures. There was there. some good laugh. Some, yeah, very some characterful. Beautiful, beautiful miniatures, and, and, and still is. Yeah, I mean, do, you, do you have any particular favourite miniatures from, from over the years? Oh, that's a terribly difficult question. It is tough. I think if I were to ask myself that question, I'd I'd be stumped because <laughs> there's so many great ones. So it's probably an unfair question again. Favorite miniatures? Mm. Oh, uh, Teclas. Right. Uh, when uh, Jez did Teclas and Tyrion, they were uh, just extraordinary models. They were so good compared to previous. I don't know how it happened, but it was like a new level had appeared. And they were so nice that we even put them in different coloured blister boxes. We made a, a, a black blister card and a, a bright red foam to set them. So, so it's, and they were the first models we could charge five pounds for, for a single model. They were so good. And, and I you felt, had to fight off the accountants, didn't you, John? Yes. Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> but yes, to, to, and it'll be another tuppence for, uh, for that packaging. You think, yes, but we can charge five pounds for that model. Look how great he is. And... Uh, yeah, that was a leap forward, I'd say. That's interesting then as well. So is that was the decision to sort of take that price point made after seeing those models yes. and seeing how good yes. they were? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes. Incredible. Pricing decisions were, uh, Robin would remember as well, it's a bit of a, we used to have these rather arcane meetings where, uh, as Rick would say, everybody's a bleeding expert. But unfortunately, at Games Workshop, every was everybody was a bleeding was expert, an expert because you know I had to sell them. Robin had to market them. Somebody had to design them. Somebody had to make sure the rules were good for them. And it's a combination of what the model looks like, how many you have to buy for your army, uh, what it does on the tabletop, and a couple of other just irrational factors mm -hmm. of it's just great, isn't it? And if you only have to buy one, well, wow, five pound doesn't sound ridiculous. You know, if you, you obviously you can't, you wouldn't want that for a bowman, would you? Because then you say we can do all the bowmen in plastic, so they can get ten for for five pounds or twenty or whatever it would have been in those days. But sometimes there's just a wow factor in a model, and uh, and nobody would begrudge paying it. John's John's just reminding me, and it's true. This is true that in. I guess all the way through the 90s, certainly in 95, when I became studio manager, there was, over at Eastwood at the factory, what was called the monthly miniatures release meeting. Yes. And I would go and Rick would go and Alan Merritt would go from the studio and John would be there for trade sales and the factory manager was Paul Robbins would be there. And I think the head of retail would be there. Was it John Gillard at the time, I think, was there. And we would literally sit around a table with all of the miniatures that had been made, the greens. These were not actually even molded yet many of them that have been made in the studio in the past month and we go what we're going to release next month then <laughs> we're talking 30 days away there was no lead time on this this was a hand-to-mouth existence and we go oh, okay we need to release something for warhammer they're there or okay we can get those out can we get some rules in white dwarf for those yeah we'll get those out and we can do this and that and that and there were, there were quite a lot occasionally not that rarely people say i don't like that model that's not very good or that's a bit shit or that needs to be remade and we would have that miniatures release meeting and 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 decide what would be what would be in the stores next month then paul robbins the poor old bugger who was running the factory would gather up those greens and have to get them molded and manufactured in volumes and blister packed or boxed and out within you know 
15, 20 days. Time. It was yeah. madness. It was madness. Wasn't That's it? incredible. Yeah. I mean, because what, like, what kind of production run would you be doing on a Techless or a, a Tyrion? How many, how many units would you need to create for that? In those days, it would have been two or 3,000. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot of metal spinning. Yeah. Because uh, the molds start to start to deteriorate. That the, obviously the longer you, hotter you run them, they start to deteriorate. But that would be for the first run as well. Actually, it might be a few more than that because by then we'd have had a hundred stores. I think there are perhaps hundreds. five thousand. Perhaps five thousand of that one you'd be doing, and that's putting yeah. you under a lot of pressure and hoping that the molds don't go down. Yeah, and the, and and on on models like that, they would have to, yeah the, the molds would burn uh, because you're spinning so many, and you'd have to make. You'd have to remake the molds, which means you've then got to go back to the masters, the original tin masters, because once you know you've only got one original that Jez has made, and and all the copies flow from that one. So you after that from the original, you then have to make um, what are called tins or first generation copies, because the the originals were often destroyed. The greens were destroyed in that process, and then you have to keep those ones in in a fireproof safe and really secure because that's all you got. There's no digital copying here. It was analog. Yeah, all, all, the... made, all these things are all made in putty, and that's best described by uh, in the chapter. There's a chap by uh, our mate called Anthony Etworth, who was the master mold maker at the time, and uh, he writes a really good uh, chapter about how the designs were and the eternal battle between the designer who wants to make this marvellous dynamic model and the mould maker has to make this bloody model to make sure it comes out. And then finally, a great big hairy caster who has to spin <laughs> it all day, every day for, for five days. And there's this mythical three-way thing that the, each... It's a bit like having a tank. There are three things as far power, speed and protection. And you give it a bigger gun, it goes slower. And if it goes slower, you've got to put more armour on it than... As you have a compromise all the time. Quite fun to watch. <laughs> there's there's none, just another story from the book that I don't think has been mentioned. In again, Mike McVeigh's chapter, uh, he talks about this virtuous circle he he got into with Jez because Mike's ability once he he figured out how to control acrylic paints with a brush, and he he talks in some detail about that process about how he developed blending. So he'd have he he have one brush in his mouth and then he put the paint on, then he spit on this brush and then use that to feather the edges. And he talks about that. He started to paint things on Jez's miniatures that Jez almost didn't know were there or did know there, but didn't know they could be painted. And then so Jez would rack that and say, right, you bug, if you can paint that, try painting this and would sculpt <laughs> finer and finer and finer detail. And, and actually Mike talks about the Eldar Aspect Warriors Oh, and the Harlequins being, you know, one of the first times that that connection between what Mike could paint and what Jez could sculpt coming together. And Mike tells the story of he got this Harlequin, I think one of the great Harlequin, where he got kind of, you know, this kind of checkerboard, multicolored checkerboard down its legs with each square absolutely blended and highlighted and on this set. And he took it in to show John Blanche and, and Jez Goodwin and they both looked at the miniature and looked at Mike and then looked at the miniature again and went, what the fuck, Mike? <laughs> <What are you?" laughs> and Mike tells that story very well. Of, it was of, a marvellous model and a marvellous paint job. And it was a marvellous paint job. And that was Mike at that point really pushing and pushing the envelope of what could be painted on a miniature that of course then forced the designers to keep pushing their design skills on what they could sculpt on a miniature and 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 as john's just said that then pushed the mold makers people like et tony Epworth, to go what can we how can we maintain this detail that these guys are putting on that and turn this into something we can manufacture in thousands without losing that and and all of that was going on it's not this is alchemy at its heart. It is oh, alchemy. It is alchemy and old-fashioned skill. I do remember we had a factory manager who didn't last very long who actually said, do we need to put all this detail on these models? And everybody stares at him, the new man. We said, well, yes. He said, we could just make them flat and with not so much detail. The molds won't burn out nearly so quickly. Have you thought of that? <laughs> yes, we had thought of that. <laughs> Yes, fantastic. Not long for the world, he wasn't. <laughs> one, one, one final question I had was just about what your favourite 
armies or, or sort of races in the games of either 40k or warhammer might have been over the years is there any that really caught your imagination and have stayed with you the whole time well being a horrible historical gamer uh, empire and uh empire for me and imperial guard for 40k <laughs> i would go in the same direction. i mean almost similar to john is that um you, you asked us earlier about favorite miniatures and i talk about i think i have favorite ranges and actually when the perrys redid the empire with that renaissance lance neck look which they didn't originate if you look if you go back and look ali developed some marauder dwarves that had a very similar look that before the Perrys adopted that same time reference period, with all the frilly sleeves and all the cutouts and the chops and all of that. And mm. I love that range. And actually the crazy stuff that came with that, you know, the war wagon and the steam tank and, the, and those those war machines. Oh, yeah. well, that, I mean, they were, they were just great. And so I love that range. And that was partly because, you know, I said I used to play uh, World War II micro armor with Andy Chambers back in the day. And, you know, I, he always used to have the Russians and I was always also have the Germans. And so that kind of I like the, the German Renaissance thing that was going on with the Empire. I then I, that's, that was always my big army. And I had a, I had an Empire army before I came to work at Wayne Games Workshop. But the early empires were kind of just a mishmash of medieval figures and Perry stuff that was around. You kind of put it together, some D&D characters and various things. And then the Wood, then the Wood Elf range that came out, uh, was it with fourth edition warhammer i think that first wood elf book with the dave gallery cover right i really love those miniatures and actually you know how can i resist an army that has a vegetarian dragon in it i mean it was just the wood elf dragon was a vegetarian army. yeah that's the that's the army for me i just noticed that's... you're wearing a harlequin shirt i am wearing a harlequin <laughs> shirt today did mike paint that one for you <laughs> yeah it's highlighted every single square by hand is <laughs> So yeah, I love the Wood Elves and I love the kind of character and the style of the Wood Elves. And I was looking back, I mean, there's a couple, at least one battle report where in White Dwarf where I, I fight with Wood Elves because I was very fond of them and the imagery and the, the kind of that cool blend of uh, sort of like kind of Native American feathers and bows and living in the woods and all of that. It was, it was just a cool image for me, caught my, caught my imagination. Did you win the, the battle report, do you remember? Oh, can I? Did I win it? What? Yeah. Uh, no, depend if they were. No, I think I, got, I think I got chopped to pieces. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but then there's another story I tell in the book. You know, I'm I'm very much of the school. I'm not. I'm not what you know. Paul and I talk about tournament gaming and how for these guys this is not a game. It's a blood sport. And <laughs> how you know, I'm very much of the Perry school of gaming. It's just you get your toys out and you put them on the table and you have a really good time. <laughs> and that's my approach to Warhammer. <laughs> And I just it's it's having a really good time, but so I probably didn't win that particular battle. And then and then I did have a 40k army, despite what I said about 40k. I like the miniatures and the models, so I had a very big Blood Angels army. <laughs> and then I moved that Blood Angels army into Epic as well. So I had a big Epic Blood Angels with Imperial Guard army because it's got lots of flyers and groovy flying things in uh, the Imperial Guard, as well as lots of shadow swords and vein blades and. Panzer companies. <laughs> yeah, all the big tanks. Yeah. All the big tanks. All the big tanks were great. And then I went to the weekend, I went up to Boyle, you know, the Bring Out Your Lead event sure. that Diane and Brian Ansel host. And actually, I walked through the door there and to my right, there was a t wonderful tabletop, big epic table. And it was full of those little bunkers and barbed wire and minefields. And I made the bunkers out of a 20 millimeter cavalry base. Oh, I don't know, sometime in the early 90s and put the article in White Dwarf. And I said to the guy, 30 years later, you've got a gaming table of mine. And he was delighted. And we had this great chat. And he <laughs> said, oh, yeah, I've got the book here. There it was. I, I copied them out of your White Dwarf article. It's just great. I mean, what, what I love about the whole hobby today is it still spans as much as this. It's as big and wide and deep as it ever was. Wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then the fact that we've got all this new stuff, but we can also reach back into that older stuff and, and that you can still go to those white dwarves and you can still build the terrain and play those armies and play those games just like we and, would have however many years ago. And let's make no mistake. The new stuff is great. Yeah. The new stuff is amazing. The new plastics that are coming out of Games Workshop are jaw dropping. And Jesus go, how have they put that together but it's a different world it's a different mm. technology yeah it's a different skill and and they've mastered that skill and games workshop you know 
I, I even when we John and I were back there, they were, we can't we would be talking to mold makers and, and they say we can't get that level of detail. But Games Workshop now 2023 have mastered that ability to engineer plastic into beautiful forms and shapes. It's breathtaking. Yeah, it's interesting how many of the things they've now achieved you can see the roots of in the kind of things that you're talking about and that get talked about in the book as well i think right that journey yeah you you, you see it on particularly in uh you know, perhaps bob naismith's or, or or tim pollard's uh chapters you see some early variants of uh of the land raider and the rhino all made out of cardboard and ping pong balls and things like that it's quite fun to see where they all came from yeah <laughs> Great stuff. So the book is expected towards the end of August. Is that right? Correct. Fantastic. Yeah, yes, it is. I mean, we've, we've got we've got the books printed, but the delay has been with the uh, slipcase engineering because we wanted this to be a class act. You know, this we've, this has been a labour of love, six year labour of love for John and I to put together and, and make do research, interview, put together. And so we went, let's go for a class act, something people love and treasure and that, that feels like a nice thing to have in your hands and your home. So we're waiting for the slipcases. So it'll be, we're going to go through. We promised, John and I promised that we would sign personally every single pre-order. And so we're getting ready to get writer's cramp and sit and have a long, so it's fueled by tea and biscuits. <laughs> we'll be a good few hundred of those to sign and uh, available from Warlord Games at the moment. That's uh, That's the only place you can get it. Right, fantastic. And then you're doing a bit of a, a sort of launch is it a reading a seminar at the open day for warlord what we're going to have on the 2nd of september at warlord uh evil headquarters uh we're going to have an open day for warlord but uh robin and i are going to be around and hopefully some of the other guys who uh, uh wrote the book including paul sawyer for a start he'll be there and we'll be uh i'll have a few copies in my office upstairs a nice air-conditioned office and people can come up for a cup of tea and a biscuit and meet whoever's there, and we will cheerfully sign their books for them. No problem at all. Fantastic. Well, I think or I they, might. Or they can buy a book on the day. Sure. Yeah. I, if if yeah. I've got my copy in hand, I'll I'll definitely uh, take you up on that tea biscuit and signature. I think, John, because uh, yeah. yeah, that sounds great. I mean, what would be nice about that? What John's describing is actually, you know, we're going to be hand signing the books for the pre-orders, but it will just kind of say Robin Hughes and John Stallard on it because we we don't we won't know who the individuals that these books can go to if you can make it along to warlord on the second then we can write you know to jordan best regards <laughs> and we can personalize <laughs> we can personalize it in a way that we can't with 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 pre-orders because you know yeah. the white people in front of us and it'll be fun it'll be fun it'll be fun time yeah well i'm i'm very much looking forward to both the book and the open day so yeah i think it's going to be great but yeah, thank you both so much for for taking the time to to chat with me. I really appreciate it, and uh, well, yeah, for a great interview to getting hold of it. No, nah, absolute pleasure. Really, really nice to talk to you, Jordan. An incredible collection of stories and memories. Thank you so much to John and Robin for talking to me about your experiences working at Games Workshop, as well as about the writing of Talking Miniatures. I genuinely cannot wait to get hold of my copy. I think it's going to be a treasure trove of stories and recollections from some of the most important people in the history of Games Workshop. If you are interested in getting hold of your own copy, I have included a link in the description below. As we mentioned in our conversation, Robin and John will both be signing copies of the book at the Warlord Games Open Day on September 2nd. I won't be signing anything, but I will be attending the Open Day. So if you happen to see me, feel free to pop over and say hello. Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. <laughs>